Okay. Thank you very much. So this is about the top-down solver. This is a fixed-point uh, algorithm. I mean, we all know fixed-point algorithms. Uh, we, we like them. We need them because abstract interpretation, when it, uh, when you try to build it into systems, typically has to compute fixed points. So we would like to do it in a, in an as efficient uh, way as possible. This top-down solver is an old one, so it is already from uh, at least from the 90s. Uh, it was invented originally for the analysis of uh, Prolog. But, uh, and I learned about it for, for via Christian Pecht. Uh, he had a very nice uh, uh, presentation of it, uh, nicer than the original ones. And then I forgot it more or less, and only uh, quite recently we found that it's very convenient and can be adapted to uh, and equipped with many more features. And so now it's the, uh, the, the working horse, so to speak, in our uh, abstract interpretation based uh, static analyzer goblet. Now what is so specific about it? I mean it, it tries to explore a system of equations on demand. So you start with the query and then the, the analyzer descends into the system and uh, computes the minimal amount of uh, information which is necessary to answer the query. So that's the first thing. So in that sense in principle it can deal with infinite systems of equations if only a finite part of it contributes to, to our query. And then the other thing which is interesting is that the right-hand sides in, the, in the, these equations are considered as black boxes. So they, are, they can be hacked by the uh, analyzer, analysis designer in an arbitrary way. Uh, and that's kind of convenient because at least uh, we find that uh, these uh, right-hand sides which we uh, introduce are horribly complicated and they grow ever more complicated. And if the fixed point algorithm always has to be changed only because the, the uh, analysis designer comes up with another fancy idea, then uh, this is uh, uh, difficult and it's also an uh, error problem. So it's better to have an application independent fixed point algorithm. Uh, so from a software, uh, software uh, engineering point of view, this is, I would say, uh, uh, important because getting the analysis right is difficult enough. If it is mixed up with the fixed point algorithm, this is a mess. So now the question is that also the problem is that also this uh, this uh, fixed point algorithm has turned into a mess because there was engineering for many years and a, lo a lot a lot of add-ons, and so one looks at that, it has more than uh, one uh, page on the screen, and is it correct? Can we understand it? And so we need uh, to have a second look at it. And uh, the idea how to have a second look at it is by means of applying uh, abstract interpretation to it. So that would be, uh, that would be the, the plan. So we, have, um, we, we would start, start out with the, with the fixed point engine, which is uh, as simple as possible, and then uh, apply uh, tricks from abstract interpretation to pimp it up and uh, get more features into it in order to, to gain efficiency, to, gain, to extend the applicability of the fixed point algorithm and also to enhance its precision. So now here, once again, so what, what is uh, the input to the solver? So the input is a system of equations, so it's just a function taking a variable, an unknown uh, x, and for each unknown x uh, comes up with the right-hand side. And the right-hand side takes a variable assignment uh, and returns a value. And now the, our solver takes such an equation system and an individual variable and returns a value. So that's it. And now here is our solver, the base solver. So it just takes these two inputs, uh, the equation system and the variable, and then it has a local function, solve. When it call, this local uh, function, when it calls for a variable, it just takes the right-hand side for it and evaluates it. Only that solve itself is handed over as the second argument. That's all, and that's it. So it's pretty, pretty simple. And here is the trace of this kind of fixed point computation. So it starts with, uh, with some unknown. So this is this U1. So I sometimes 
to avoid, try to avoid this word, uh, the wording of a variable because it's not a program variable, it's an, uh, a piece of information which we would like to compute, so typically a program point or something. So therefore you like program point. So this is, so we start with this unknown U1 and then there comes the right hand side. There are many unknowns which are queried in sequence and then at some point so one unknown has another right hand side and we evaluate and descend into more. So that would be the trace. The only point is here that the right hand side functions are just pieces of code. They are black boxes. So they can be anything. So they can write to, uh, to disk, they can kind of uh, communicate with the user, uh, that is, uh, they can do anything. So what is the minimal requirement which we expect and that minimal requirement is purity. And that means that the function is kind of ignorant of the solver state. And what does it mean to be ignorant of the solver state? So if you want to do it mathematically, you could wrap the, uh, the uh, domain elements in a monad and then uh, the function should be uh, parametric in the monad. So, you could, so that means it, could, it cannot access the state of the surrounding world. So it cannot kind of, there's no counter outside so that I, which counts uh, up uh, for every call of the function and that kind of is queried by the function. So that's not possible. Yeah, so that is uh, this minimal requirement which I assume. And that has, uh, then these guys, Martin Hoffman and Alex Karbic have they kind of investigated this notion and found that under this minimal assumption, the right, this function f has a representation as a computation tree, which is somehow natural. The computation tree is either gives an answer, like uh, five, or it has a query to a variable, and then a continuation, uh, which uh, is a function which takes any value from the uh, variable and provides uh, another computation tree for it. So that is where to uh, continue with the evaluation. And when you execute such a uh, computation tree, you go a, a path from, a, from the root to a leaf where there are all queries to variables, and in the end you come with the answer. So that is, uh, in the, uh, altogether, this, this trace uh, then uh, tra traverses in this way. Then, so the horizontally, this is this path through this computation tree where you query these, uh, these unknowns, and for each unknown uh, you get a value, and then in the end you get a value back. And uh, the, while doing so, you could also trace some state uh, through, that's the solver state, through the computation. And this state, in some sense, is in the, in, or not in some sense, it precisely is an abstraction of the reaching trace. So when you arrive at a variable, so you have seen everything which is above and to the left. And that's kind of uh, all that, you could put all that into this state, but you could also take some information, extract it from that, and put that into the state. And for, uh, one trivial example is if you just want to collect the unknowns uh, which you have encountered with their values. So, yeah, so that would, would mean, so before you start evaluating the right-hand side, you set this... Uh, the sigma to the, to the empty map, and then whenever you have evaluated the right hand side, you take the value and add it to your, uh, together with the variable to your uh, state. And in the end, you return that together with the value. So that's it. That's tabulation, which makes it a little bit more practical, but still the whole thing is uh, very uh, useless because it cannot deal with uh, recursive dependencies. So when, you, when we analyze programs with loops or something, there's always recursive dependency. So that algorithm would then not terminate because in this computation, uh, in this uh, trace, you would arrive at the same uh, unknown multiple times and that is you would descend forever and you'd get a stack overflow but no result. And so what would one do? What the one would have to equip the solver with the positive, with the, with tr keeping track of the unknowns in on the in in the in the branch, so this is you you monitor those unknowns which have been called, and then you introduce when uh, an iteration so that this uh, vertical uh, uh, iteration kind of is uh, turned into a horizontal one, and you start with bottom, and then you iterate uh, according to your lattice. So that is this when this situation occurs, you kind of uh, do not uh, continue solving into the re uh, recursively occurring uh, unknown, but you stop there and you instead perform an iteration. So that's uh, this thing. 
And so here you see uh, that is now the state has also this uh, set called, which is, which is initialized to the empty set in the beginning. And uh, then the solve itself uh, has a local function iterate, which does the iteration. And before it uh, descending into evaluating the right hand side, it, it, it puts the current variable into this call set. And when it, the right hand side is, uh, when the equation, the right hand side of the equation is. Uh, is finished, then it removes the, the variable again from the uh, from the set code, and that's uh, that's. So it. Ah yeah yeah. So at at some point, uh, so you uh, you check then uh, after the evaluation if you, you you have a fixed point, and if so, then you turn the sigma, and otherwise you uh, you update. Uh, and uh, you continue with the iteration until hopefully you arrive at an equality. So here is no widening and narrowing, so it's just plain, so we have to, to be careful. So it's just limited to uh, uh, partial orders where there is something like uh, uh, complete lattice and monotonic uh, right-hand sides where you have a finite ascending chain. So it's very, still very limited in its applicab applicability, but at least now it's a fixed point algorithm with, which computes something. So it's still, uh, there's still, it's very inefficient still because when you encounter the same thing twice, you would iterate on it a second time. So this is obviously completely inefficient. So what one would, five minutes? Oh, okay, so what you would have to do, you would have to, to, to check, okay, if it already has been computed, then you just look it up. But you must, it could also be that you have computed it, but the value is no longer valid. And so therefore you have to track dependencies. And that is also done dynamically. So you do not go for the control flow graphs or something. You just, you monitor influences between unknowns. And uh, then you m monitor a set of st stables where you report, uh, record those unknowns which are still, which have still the correct value. And when you found such a thing, you look it up. So uh, here is, uh, I kind of, since it's only five minutes and I guess this widening and narrowing thing is more interesting, so I just skip that over, I only mention here that these influences can be, when you solve, you record this, uh, these influences. Yeah? And then by that you can kind of uh, get the influences on the fly. So that's uh, the thing. And in this way you, see, you saw, saw the trick. Always you monitor what you are doing, you collect some information and you use that to improve your, uh, the, the algorithm. And so there are many things what you can do. We would like, I would like to uh, speak about this widening and narrowing thing. Uh, now, the, the, pro the first thing is how to detect the points where to apply the widening and narrowing. And we have no pre-computation, so we cannot find loop heads or something. So what would we do? And the idea is, so then we, when we look up the value of a variable by means of this solve, we check whether it is called, and then we make it a widening point. And that is... Uh, and I kind of may show you here the impact of that. So if we query this program here at the endpoint zero, then we would descend, we would look at uh, descend into one, then we evaluate two, this is fine, there's nothing more to, to be done. Then in order to get one, we have to descend into three, four, five, and then we come to one again, and that is on the, this is called, and so therefore one is a widening point. And this is great. This is exactly the point which we want to have. And so this works fine. And then one more thing, if, when we do the iterate, uh, we need an iteration for the narrowing, an iteration for the widening, and the plane iteration. And this, the, the thing with the narrowing iteration is one, so it's just like the ordinary iteration, we use the narrowing operator, but there's one more thing which we do, and that is in the end, when it stabilizes, we remove the current unknown from the, uh, from the widening, uh, from the widening points. So it's no longer a widening point afterwards. Why do we do so? Here's a very stupid example. So this is two nested loops. So if you do static detection of widening points, you would make one and two widening points. And that means in the end, when you do stupid interval analysis with the classical widening and narrowing, you would lose the upper bound for the outside eye. Because some, in, uh, the, the, some infinity is hidden somewhere down in the inner loop and it doesn't go away. And that kind of it destroys the, uh, the upper bound. And this is bad, so, but if we remove the, uh, after each inner iteration, we remove it as a widening point, there is no infinity stuck in there, and so we really get a, a more precise result here. So therefore it pays off to do the detection of the widening points auto 
dynamically and also to remove them. So it's not an ever-growing set. So, okay, so then uh, here I have something about the iteration, but I need not show it. I go directly to the conclusion. I would like to say that just advocate these local solvers to be included into all these toolboxes which you provide for abstract interpretation. Why not provide some fixed point algorithms and in particular those which are kind of ignorant about whether what kind of uh, syntax you use, what kind of programming language you use, is all not necessary. Use such kind of generic local solvers to, as uh, workhorses for your, and, or at least offer them. You need not. And in some sense, the behavior is somehow uh, similar. I would say, it, in my understanding, it, is the, it, it achieves the same effect as when you iterate over the syntax. Only there it is kind of uh, the, the iteration behavior, I think, of the top-down solver is quite similar, only that it is application independent. And it, I, would, I hope I have convinced you that this A to, uh, A to I is a, uh, can be used here and this TD is a nice uh, use case for showing what you can do with A to I. Okay, thank you very much. I go to Patrick. Uh, I have two questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one is uh, on an impression that is, it might be that the widening changes spot during the computation. That is, in, in most analyzers, you decide which point you are going to widen and then you do the iteration. I have the impression with your algorithm, the point where you do the widening might not be the same at each iteration. I'm not sure, but. It, it, will be the, it will be the same ah. in this case, since the variable dependencies yeah, are less. Yeah, in this example, different. but in general. In general, it could be different. It could, it, it, and it will be, because we, we have uh, typically variable dependencies change. Because yes, we yeah. have, uh, and then uh, so, so it it's very dynamic. So it should be also more precise in this, no? Hmm? It should be more precise result, because I mean, the widening always has the same yes, point. Yes, it could be, but whether it really yeah, works yeah, out in practice, difficult. this is a different story. And one can, I must also admit, one can hear this effect by the re recovering the outer uh, uh, thing you could achieve by, in the first iteration, you simply do no widening, also yeah. at a widening point. And then I guess you would not lose this... Uh, this uh, <laughs> Uh, and That's another trick, but that is also this kind of, this gives this uh, doing the widening depending on how often you will reach something. This is also a, a to I somehow. You record something, how often you have reached a broken point. So it's, there are different uh, possibilities how to achieve, achieve the same effect. And the second point was uh, related to many talk where the equations change during the analysis. And you said you do not depend on the right hand side. So uh, I concluded that you might be able to handle this case where right hand side of equation change during the analysis. That could that could be. It, I, one would have to, to to look at it. So if in in some sense yes. So if one kind of if it is reevaluated and then. Uh, it could the right hand side could could be different, so there's no yeah. no reason why it shouldn't be the case, depending on the solver state. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. No. So thanks again. Yeah.